Okay, now I we got this. Right. Salam alaikum and greetings and peace be upon you. Welcome to NCC. Um, in our tradition, we start with prayer, so it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you our Imam, Imam Ibrahim Qadr. Imam Qadr joins us recently from Charlotte, North Carolina, and serves as the Imam for all three locations. This one here, our location in Skokie, Illinois, and also in Morton Grove, Illinois. He um, joins us from Charlottesville, North Carolina. Charlotte, right? Charlotte. Charlotte, that's right. I used to live in the South, so I always kind of get mixed up with Charlotte and Charlottesville. Um, he holds a degree in um, Sharia law from Medina University. It's a, a pretty much the place to study, actually, in Islamic theology and scholarly. Um, and, and he. Um, we're pleased to welcome him and his family to our community. So I'm going to invite him up here to say a prayer, and then we'll get the program started. Imam Khadr? Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. Thank you so much for uh, welcoming me here, and I thank all of our guests. Uh, honored visitors. Um, Ramadan Mubarak to all of you. Um, I'm not necessarily going to be doing a prayer. I'm going to change things up a little bit. I'm going to read from the Quran and explain piece by piece as we move on. Um, and I'm, uh, uh, the main point that I'm getting across is the uh, welcoming this, this religion has to diversity. God says in the chapter of the Romans, not Romans and <laughs> this is the chapter of the Romans. God says, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. And from his signs, from the evidence that God exists, is that he created you from dirt. And from that you become humanity uh, uh, spreading throughout the land. You proliferate in your population. And from his signs is that he created from you a mate so that you may seek comfort in them. And taskunu comes from the root word sakana, sakana. And in Arabic, it always goes back to a root two, three, four letter word that holds a common theme even if the actual definition changes. So for example, sakana can be masakin, it can be, uh, as we see here, teskunu, or it can be sakina. And all of it means, the sakana, means to have tranquility and stillness and calmness and to be uh, uh, that, that, that homey feeling, to be at home. So your mates are something where you can go and feel at home with and feel that serenity. That is a sign of God. And it is He who instilled in you love and mercy between each other. That love and mercy that we see between our, our, our spouses and our loved ones and the people that we know, that in itself is a sign of God. Indeed, in these are signs for those who will think. And from His signs, the creation of the heavens and the earth and how grand it is in creation. Look at how big and ginormous and uh, 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 terrifying us at points it can be. Paired with this majestic creation is the creation of different dialects and different skin tones. God compares them both together. Indeed, in these signs are though indeed in these signs or in this are signs for those who know. And from his signs, your sleep and rest in the day and night. Right? You have the early birds and you have the night owls. Both of these people are signs of God that they can take rest in the day and night. And when you go out seeking whatever it is you seek in the earth, this is a sign of God as well. Indeed, these are signs for those who will listen. And from his signs, 
He shows you the lightning that you see in the sky. خَوْفًا وَطَمَعًا it, instill, it instills fear and it instills hope at the same time. One may ask, how does lightning instill hope if it's something so terrifying? God answers it forward. وَيُنَزِّلُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً And He brings from the sky rain. فَيُحْيِي بِهِ الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا And He brings the earth to life after it has died. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمِ يَعْقِلُونَ Indeed, these are signs for those who use their intellect. As you can see here, all of these beautiful signs that we see, in the, the, the small details that sometimes we don't even notice, are signs of God. And one of them, as we mentioned earlier, is diversity and knowing people from different cultures and different languages and different skin tones. It's not something to look down on, rather it's something to enjoy and praise God for that because that shows the grandeur of His creation and His majesty, praise be He. So I thank you for this time, and I'm sorry I took, uh, I don't know if I went over. Um, please forgive me for that. Thank you so much, and uh, I hope you have a great time, uh, and enjoy your flock. Salaam alaikum. This is a very special month for Muslims, one that is marked with prayer, fasting, reflection, community, and charity. It's a month that teaches us sacrifice, discipline, and empathy. I see Kamran's not here, so we're going to go a little bit out of order today. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce to you our next speaker, given the theme of our evening tonight. It's more important than ever to take time and appreciate our immigration history, what newcomers bring to our nation and to our lives. The roots of this country go back to many successive generations of, immigration, of immigrants. Our next speaker is actually Nara <coughs> She is joining us along with Itadel Shalabi, who is also here. They are really pioneers in this space. They lead an organization that was established, that they co-established in 2001, um, called the American, Arab American Family Services. Sorry about that. Um, it's a really amazing organization that provides social services, reducing cultural barriers, and facilitating the success of the Arab American community in, in our city and beyond. They've had a really interesting encounter recently in Tijuana, Mexico, and we'd like to bring them up, um, we'd like to invite her to share her experiences from that. Palestinian. I am Arab American. 
I am Muslim. In 2018, I was blessed and I had the honor and the privilege of traveling to Palestine for the first time in 27 years. I had the opportunity, and I'm glad I get emotional when I talk about Palestine, but for the first time in 27 years, I get to go back home and visit my ancestors' land, my parents' land, and my birthplace. It was an exceptional experience, it was a beautiful experience, and um, it was two weeks. It was short, bittersweet, but it did this, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it did, it's, uh, it, it, it just uh, continued and it built more memories for me. In those two weeks, I got to connect with my family, with my friends, I got to see Palestine. I was privileged to stay with family members who were actually across the street from the Dome of the Rock. And that to Muslims, as you know, that is, that is an honor bestowed upon us. So we, I was, I was um, blessed in so many ways. In those two weeks, I got to visit all of Palestine, from the 48 to the West Bank. I was able to spend love time, time with my loved ones. I, I had the opportunity to visit and travel across all of, again, Palestine. And I saw the beauty, I saw the resilience, I saw the passion in people's eyes. I saw, I got to connect and talk to people, hear their stories. I got to see who I am as a woman, as a Palestinian, as a Muslim. And it's something that I will treasure for life. But in, in those two weeks, I, got, I also got to see the struggles of my people. The Palestinian people. I got to see what their day-to-day -day looks like. Again, I am coming in visiting um, Palestine, Palestinians. So for me, it was a kind of a step back, just observing and watching. But what I noticed is, and which is of course, who's been to Palestine before? Okay, I would think you've been to that. <laughs> But one of the things, if you've ever traveled to Palestine, Palestine, there's this visible wall. You can't get away from it. The apartheid wall. It's all over Palestine. I was speaking to our sister Hamida earlier, and she, um, to her understanding, thought the wall was in Gaza only. No. The reality is the wall is across all of Palestine. It cuts deep into Palestine. And I saw the struggles of our people, my people, my family, my loved ones, having whether to cross the border, the wall, going through curfews, through checkpoints. And it just, for me, uh, so many feelings, a roller coaster of feelings, mentally, emotionally, at every level. And when I came back, you know, you come home, it's a vacation, you left all that behind you. Then you come back, and then here you are, you know, you come back to the, the media and the news, and then what do you hear? Our President Trump wanting to build a wall. And for the longest, it just resonated, it resonated and it just, so many emotions. Having personally seen the wall in Palestine, if you've ever come across the wall in Palestine, it's about 30 feet tall, it's construction, it's very heavy, um, you can't see through it, you can't see the other side, it's a complete block. Having come back home and just having to, you know, hear your own president, your own government pushing and wanting to build the wall, all I could think of and all I could relate to or think about, the struggles of our Latino brothers and sisters. And it just, it continuously, you know, I came back and I was telling up to dad, what do we mean we're going to have a wall? You know, but did you ever see the wall in Palestine? She's like, yes. And you have to really experience that travel and to see something black you to understand the impact it has on you. And since that trip, we said we need to build a relationship with our Latino brothers and sisters. Mind you, the work that we do, and I'll get into what we do at AFS, we've had these relationships. But there was a sense of obligation, a duty to understand. I couldn't even think to, you know, I couldn't even imagine the, what they were going through, what our Latino brothers and sisters were going through as they were hearing their own, for some, their own president speaking building a wall, dividing them, their families, their villages, their loved ones. And because that's what I saw. When I saw the wall in Palestine, it cuts through villages. Um, some homes were torn. Um, you know, people uh, not being able to see their loved ones. Touch, some of them have gone for decades. As long as 70 years not being able to connect with their loved ones and their families. And that's all I could remember. And I looked at her and I said, up to that, we have to do something. We have to strengthen the tie, deepen the tie between our Latino brothers and sisters and other communities and say, 
How do we learn about their you know, experiences? And how do we learn about their struggles? Because one thing I learned from this trip, from the past trip, is that we had more in common than we wanted to admit, especially the Latino community and the Palestinian community. And we said, you know what? We need to do something. And we came across and we said, we're, we're going to bring a couple of our friends, different faiths, different communities, and we're going to go visit Tijuana. And we did visit Tijuana. But we should, before I share my experiences with you about Tijuana, I thought it, was, it would be important to share, to tell you a little bit about what we do and who we are. So my name is Nelly Mantaha, in English, Nerman. Not Marilyn. <laughs> Nerman Taha, I'm the co-founder director of Arab American Family Services, my business partner at Tidal Shadavi, co-founder executive director. And we have been doing Arab American Family Services since 2001 for the past 18 years. And actually we have a very special person in the room today, our very own staff, Abu Bekir. <laughs> for immigration, he helps our clients apply for their citizenship. So welcome, Abu Bakr. Um, a little bit about who we are. Arab American Family Services, established in 2001 by both of us, two women who, put, who we put our time and dedication and commitment to build an organization for community members. Um, I'll be very honest, uh, initially back then, 18 years ago, we wanted to serve the Arab American community. And over the years, as we grew and we built relationships and we built trust, um, our mission and vision expanded to help all those in need, regardless of what community and faith they come from. It is a, five, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. It is a multi-social service organization and I'll go through the programs and services. Just last year alone in 2018, I'm proud to say that we served 15,144 families uh, total and families, a total of 59,000 individuals in 2018. We started with both of us in 2018, and now I'm proud to say we have about 34, 35 staff, alhamdulillah, I mean, and we went from a zero budget to a $2 million budget. Um, I know for a lot of nonprofits this is not huge, this is not big, but taking, you know, the fact that it was two, started by two women who really had, um, as I say, no clue in terms of how to start a nonprofit. <laughs> we are proud of what we've done. Atida has her master's in social work, I have my master's in public service. And we're, we're here to basically, our mission and vision, our, our love and passion is to serve our community and make sure that our families have the resources they need to lead healthier lives. Our programs and services, initially we started with public benefits. The reality is you can't help someone if they need food and shelter, right? Healthcare, that's a cuts across all communities. Um, elderly services, we have a program dedicated to anyone 60 and older. Uh, we help them get their Medicaid, Medicare, we have a program, uh, an elderly program, a congregate meal in the south, uh, south town in Bridgeview. Um, who's heard of uh, Al Gawadi restaurant? So if you're 60 and older, or if you have your mom and dad, please bring them to Al Bawadi. It's a congregate meal, it's a luncheon program every day, one to four, they come and enjoy a Middle Eastern lunch. And it's really not about the food as much as really getting them out of their isolation and depression and making friends. I really love it. Sometimes we need to kick them out. <laughs> Domestic violence and sexual assault, we're not immune. As an Arab and Muslim community, we're not immune. The reality, these are topics and issues that happen in our community like all communities. We have been able to bring, we alhamdulillah have been blessed to bring resources to the victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. Employment, again, the reality, economically, you know, economically it impacts all communities. We have an employment program, we help families get up back on their feet, job search, uh, interviews, um, you know, uh, job placement, and so forth. Civic engagement and advocacy. We realized early on to get things done, we have to be at the forefront of policy. We have to get the community mobilized. We have to get the community to know that they have a voice and one that is powerful. And how do you do that? Through civic engagement and advocacy. Part of our mission is to empower, to educate, and to assist and advocate. You know, building that self-confidence and letting people know that they're important and they're valued and they have a voice has been a piece of who we are as an organization. Uh, English second language classes. These have been an integral part of who we are. We teach our families, individuals, women, adults, 
to learn English. It's important that, that not only that they learn the English, but it's a nice way to integrate in their local communities, to connect with their children, um, to help a lot, you know, to, to feel confident about who they are. Uh, annual, annual projects, we do food drives, holiday drives, turkey drives. Uh, you'll see a lot of drives in Ramadan this time of the year. We have Take on Hate. Take on Hate is a project that we're involved in. It's a coalition of organizations where we stand up against um, hate, racism, bigotry. How many of you have heard of the Sharon Brannigan on the South Side? That's it? We're all going to go home and do research now. But the reality is um, she is a trustee in a local township who has been very vocal about her opinion on Arabs and Muslims. And the area, Pales, uh, Pales Township covers about seven cities. Uh, Bridgeview, Burb uh, I'm sorry, Bridgeview, Worth, uh, Pales Hills, and his southwest suburbs. But she has been, the audacity and she has been emboldened to really come out and say, what are these Arabs doing here in our communities? Um, abusing and misusing the system and so forth. So we're proud to, proud to say that part of Take On Hate for 21 months, every month we have been diligent and committed a group of 150 people, Arabs and non-Arabs, who stand together in solidarity and say, we will not have this in our community, we will not have this in our backyard. And you have to also understand, as a Muslim community, you have a right to speak up against anyone who thinks you don't belong here. And we need to empower ourselves, and we need to educate, and we need to teach our kids how to stand up for their rights. So she has been someone who's been vocal against our kids as well. And we uh, initiated this project and said, this will, we will not tolerate this. And it's been, um, for 21 months, she hasn't resigned. Our ask is that she resign, but if she continues to stay, we continue to come back. Um, voter registration. I think there has been a wake-up call in our Muslim community how important voter registration is. Do we all do voter registration here? Wonderful, because that's important. That's your visibility. For example, as Arab Americans, I know as Arabs in the census we're counted as white, and we'll come to the census. But Making sure that our community is educated, empowered, and goes out and vote is important to our local legislators, and that's the only way you'll get heard. Census is one of the new upcoming projects that we'll be doing, is making sure that all our hard-to-count communities are counted. And we are a hard-to-count community as a Muslim community. So please, if one of your, um, as we educate the community in the next year, because census comes up next April, we encourage you that you go ahead and fill out your application and make sure that you're counted as a community because that's where all the funding comes back to each of the respective states and we want to make sure that our communities as Muslim and Arab get that piece of funding. Have I bored anyone? No. Um, thank God. Okay. So, moving on. See, these are some of the visuals. I thought it would be helpful for those who got bored from hearing me speak. Yeah, we got the I vote. We encourage everyone. If you follow us on our Facebook, you'll see all the interaction. We're quite fun. I vote. Then we have our Muslim, Arab woman, Muslim woman who um, went through their English classes. So Abu Bakr here will assess you. We'll do a consultation. And if you're ready to apply for citizenship, then he does so. But if not, what happens? He will encourage you to attend one of our English second language classes. And from there, you are part of a program, either a semester or two, depending on your level. And then you come back and apply for citizenship. And in that time, uh, we're proud to say that last month, about seven women who don't speak English, don't write English, studied for their exam and passed. So we're excited. Uh, Coke drives, food drives, this is just recently. Um, this actually was last week, the food. Uh, in every Ramadan, we make sure that our families, even though they do get, get food stamps, um, we make sure uh, that they have, they never go out, go through Ramadan missing or lacking food. That's important for us. Um, our last picture, the purple one, the, the staff, is what is love? What is a healthy relationship? Domestic violence, as I mentioned, sexual assault, these are, these are issues in our community and the reality is we don't talk much about it. And our effort, well, we mobilize for the office is an ongoing education. What is, you know, what is a healthy relationship? What is, uh, what is love and what is respect? What is understanding? We do a walk every October. Please join us. It's a walk against domestic violence and cancer. But it, these are two programs that are full, um, fully staffed, professional staff who speak, uh, they're bilingual, bicultural, and they sit with the victim and they do a safety planning, they do an order of protection, they educate and they empower, they help for employment if she needs to go to a shelter. All of those services are in-house at Arab American Family Services. 
I just timed myself. I went over my time, sorry. But, um, okay, so, um, one of the programs I completely forgot to add is our mental health program, which is a critical component of the work that we do. Mental health, okay, I'm sorry, shifted, okay. Oh. Um, advocacy, this is again the advocacy that we spoke about. We're in Springfield um, during the entire sessions, whether it's in March, whether it's in February, whether it's October, November. Our office, we make sure that we're out at the forefront of advocating for Arabs and Muslims. Actually, we're proud to say that Atidal and I, the office uh, spearheaded by Atidal, last year we passed SB 3488, which is an anti-registry program, making sure that the state and the federal uh, government never um, subject Muslims and Arabs to any type of registry. So we're really proud of that initiative and really proud of that bill. Um, now moving on to our trip to Tijuana. Um, you can see here that this is our group that we mentioned earlier. There was about 15 of us, uh, different faith, different backgrounds. Really, none of us have ever visited Tijuana before this time. Uh, other than what we would hear on the news and the media, we had no clue. Um, many of us went with uh, high-level anxiety, because again, this is the border trip, and all you've ever heard were detentions, people being arrested, people being harassed. And I'm just being honest, in terms of what the, a lot of the conversations behind the scene were, and how, what the feelings were behind the scene. And uh, that is basically, and I'll get to these scenes, but this is a group that all of us went. It was a first time learning experience and it was a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. Has anyone ever visited the border? Okay, wonderful, great, great. Um, and the border, when we talk about the border, there's kind of four states across the border, the southern border. There's the San Diego, of course, California border, there's Arizona, and there is um, Nevada, and then there is Texas. So when we talk about the southern border, that's what we're talking about. No one ever talks about the northern border because they're good. Yeah. Um, we talked about why we decided to go because again, it just for me it resonated being a Palestinian and I saw the struggles of my people and I thought it would be shame on us to to do what we do as social services, social justice, and although we've had these relationships with our Latino community members, with all community members, because we feel. We believe in making sure that what I have in a right, that someone else has that same right. And we came together, as I mentioned earlier, to visit and to, to learn more about their experiences, struggles, and challenges. Um, some pictures, visual. That's me. You can't see me. That's me. Uh, this is in front of the wall. It is, this is in Palestine. It is 30 feet tall. It's humongous. You really look very small next to it. This is the this is the wall in across Palestine. Can everyone see it? So it's not in one respective area. It is not in Gaza. It's actually across Palestine. It completely splits and divides Palestine. And families on this side of town, they can probably have never seen each other. Maybe will never see each other, or maybe have to go through a special entrance, need to apply for a certain you know visa or. Um, our pass. Um, and then that's Tijuana. This is us. These now, when we talk about the wall, it's important to understand, which is a lot of people when we talk about, when we talk about here the wall, here it is um, pretty much 30 feet tall. It is uh, blocks and blocks of cement. There is no, you can't see through it. It's completely blocked off. In Tijuana, it's, and it's more like metal panels and wire fences. But it's still called technically a wall. So, just kind of a visual. We can't forget our Japanese American. Uh, again, this is a community has gone through the same challenges and struggles. A little bit about the wall in terms of costs and funding. As we know, Trump is asking for $8 billion in, in, in budget for this wall. Currently, in 2019, he has up $1.6 billion. He does have $1.6 billion. He declared it a national emergency. As you know, this is his way of getting people to fund the wall. 
Um, in the southern borders, as I talked about the southern borders of the U.S., there's about 1,954 1, miles of the southern border. So far, 580 miles are fenced already. They're not construction, they're not big blocks of, of cement, but there's already fent wired fences and kind of metal panels, which you've seen earlier. Just to bring to everybody's attention, this wall, this wall and the wall that's coming up, that will look like this wall, by the way. It will not be wire fences or there will not be metal uh, panels. It will look like this. It will be made by the same company that will build the wall in Palestine. It's called Alta North America. He contracted with the same company. So when he's talking about building a wall, this is what he's looking to build because it's the same company, the same manufacturer. One of the things that we've learned when we visited Tijuana, and all of this was news to us, this is all learning experiences, wanting to connect with our, um, having a deeper sense and stronger relationship with our Latino brothers and sisters. What we learned on our trip is the 100 mile radius law. Have we heard about, about this? Okay, this was a shock to us. So basically, anywhere in the US, anywhere in the US, 100 air miles, we are all subject, as Americans, under this law. So Customs and Border, we, are, we have the largest police force, Customs and Border Protection. They can stop, search, and detain, detain you. 200 million Americans, which basically doesn't leave much. We're a population of 340 million. 200 million Americans, all of us here, can be stopped, searched, and detained under this 100 mile, 100 air mile. Anyone know that? Shocking. Yeah. So, 200 million of us live in within the 100 mile zone. These cities, Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Hawaii, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, and Vermont entirely, or almost entirely, are within this area, jurisdiction. Also, nine of the ten largest U.S. metropolitan areas, as determined by the 2010 census, also fall within this zone. New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Houston, Philadelphia, Phoenix, San Antonio, San Diego, and San Jose. I don't know about you, but for me that was really surprising. To know that there is so much federal re regulation and so much um, power and these are not lands, these are not miles and lands, this is not water, this is 100 mile air miles. So, uh, the problem is, are we protected? Yes. So we have the Fourth Amendment uh, protects us from the, any of the stops and searches, but the reality is a lot of times the border, the U.S. Customs and Border abuse the law. And what happens is that if we continue, if we as Americans, regardless of status, the issue now is not status, but regardless, if we don't speak up and we don't fight against these types of abuses, then the chance of us losing our freedom is on its way. And that is a scary problem. That is a scary, that's the fight that we have to fight. Being educated, knowing your rights is important. So Tijuana is a port of entry. So you have San Diego. And then when we were there from San Diego, basically um, we got a van. It's a 10 minute drive and then you cross the border into Tijuana. It's not a hard drive. Um, it is not a scary city. Please don't believe the media. It's like when people tell me, oh you go to Palestine? Oh my God, are there bombs everywhere? Like, no. You know, when you go to the Middle East, is, are people killing each other? I'm like, no. It was such a beautiful city. The people are beautiful. The land is beautiful. The nature is beautiful. I encourage everyone to really take a trip. Um, no doubt that there is, you know, people are um, afraid. There is risks. But I, I, I personally say, take the experience. Um, contrary to belief, everyone who's crossing is not is not a Latina or a Latino. A lot of times, what media makes it out to me is that those Mexicans are crossing the border. 
right? We all we think it's Mexicans crossing the border. Well, the reality is when we got to connect with the uh, American Friends Service Committee, who are on the grounds, who work with us day to day, and when we talk to the Latino organization, to the Tijuana shelters and agencies, they said that's not the case. That's not the case. Many of the people, yeah, my apologies. Many of the people crossing are Central Americans, people in, uh, from Haiti, uh, Syrians, people from Yemen, people from Afghanistan, uh, people from India and Pakistan. Believe it or not, we were all shocked. And we asked, how, how is that? Well, what happens is there are those what they call coyotes. They bribe people and say, oh, if you can handle the fight in the war in Syria, if you can, you know, if you've lived through Iraq, if you've lived through, you know, the struggle between Indians and Pakistanis, you can, you can cross that desert. It's not a problem. And they charge people seven, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. And then these people, unfortunately, try to cross the border and some die, some live and they get caught. But then they're sent back to Tijuana where Tijuana has shelters and they house these individuals and families, whether they're waiting for papers, whether to know what what's gonna to happen to them, whatever the case is. But shelters only accommodate up to 45 days in Tijuana. And then after 45 days, people have to find their next living. Just our overall three days. I know, I don't wanna, my apologies, engine. Mm -hmm. uh, this is our visit to uh, American Friends Service Committee. This is on the US side. This is, we went to visit Chicano. It's a beautiful park in San Diego. It's an absolute must if you're in San Diego to go visit. All the murals that you'll see are a history of um, Aztecs, murals of Aztecs. It's Chicano, Mexicano um, art displayed. And it, they're all historical pieces. They have such beautiful meaning to the history of the people and the migrants in San Diego. This is us. We visited the Palestinian youth movement. And that was so beautiful to learn that there was Palestinians, youth groups, who were connecting with the younger generation of Latino immigrants and Latinos and saying, we know your struggle. You're Palestinian. You're Mexican. I know what that wall did to you. I know that what that wall will do to you. Our families crossing are not, I haven't seen my father. I mean, we got into a taxi and she said, um, you know, this is my first time traveling to go see my father for the first time. I haven't seen him in, in years. She just got her papers. And those are the stories that you hear on the ground. And it just, again, this is the struggles, the common sh struggles and challenges that our immigrant communities deal with. No, you're right. On the ground, what we did is we passed out pamphlets to people. On the US side, we were standing there on the US side passing out of information as people were crossing the border because we wanted them to know that they have rights. And if anyone was stopping them or searching them, they had a number to call. Um, on the, again, all of us on the U.S. side, um, it was interesting to, to look at the signs. And one of the signs says, your conversations and actions are being recorded. Kid you not, this is the picture we took. This is all, again, from the, on the San Diego part, as you're walking the bridge, you're still on U.S. land. And, you know, all of this, all of the action that's being taken is recorded. More pictures. This is what we talk about when they say the wall. Currently, the wall are these metal panels, but again, the wall that he's claiming to build is again is concrete, concrete blocks that's coming. Friendship Park. This is a friendship park between. Um, now we went to both sides. We went to the U.S. side of Friendship Park, and we went to the Tijuana side of uh, Friendship Park. And this right cuts right into the the ocean and. The sad case, if you look here, I'm gonna take you. This is what we call the, pink, the finger, uh, pinky finger, where families only have this size, where they touch each other because that's the only form of contact they have. And these are families who've never seen each other in such a long time, and this is their only way of connecting and seeing each other. Sometimes they'll open the, the friendship part for a few hours, but that's up to their discretion. But this is as much as contact as families get. Your pinky. Not even a hug or a kiss or anything. This is Paulina from one of the shelters, a phenomenal 23-year-old who just bought a building to house these migrants, these people, families, and children who didn't have a home in Tijuana. Phenomenal, phenomenal. If you're looking to support, 
this Ramadan, I would encourage you to visit their shelter and really um, every bit of helps. They provide the food, the shelter, the, the sleeping arrangements, everything for these families, whether they be Syrians, whether they be people from Haiti, whether it be from Afghanistan, they give them a home to sleep and to rest for the few next couple of days that they're in Tijuana. Some have made Tijuana their home, by the way. Because after 45 days, there is no entry into the U.S. and there's no back going home. Because, for example, people of Haiti with the earthquake, they don't have their home anymore. And so Tijuana has become their home. Global takeaways. One of the things we took away from our trip, the importance of building bridges of love, respect, and understanding. I mean, I can't tell you how happy to see the diversity of this room and the fact that people want to learn and just share experiences and build a bond together. Um, we all have a stake. We all have a stake in, in this wall that's coming up. Um, we all of us, how many of us fall into that rhetoric, good immigrant, bad immigrant? Right? Even within in our own internal communities. Oh, he's a bad Muslim, good Muslim. Oh, she's a good Arab, bad Arab. I think this is all like in the stereotypes and the media and this is the power and uh, the, the, the divide that government wants to see between us. Again, I think was saying, you know, personal knowledge, please go out, come out of your comfort zone, connect. I encourage everyone to visit and learn about other communities, their struggles and challenges and how you can help. Um, grassroots for us, what we did, like I said, we looked at each other, we both experienced Palestine, we saw the struggles of our own people and said, let's do something. Let's really connect with our Latino brothers and sisters and what we did grassroots, we picked up and visited Tijuana. And one of the things we came back and promised is not only did we come back and talk about Tijuana and the experiences of Tijuana, but we, may, we donate. We come back and donate to their shelters. We spread the word that whatever the media you're hearing is false. It's not Latinos only that are coming through. They're not criminals. These are hardworking people who are trying to make a living. Um, talk to your elected officials. Talk to your legislators. I tell you, half of them don't know what's on the ground. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you so much. Interfaith Outreach Iftar, uh, we just want to see uh, MCC was established in 1969, so obviously we are, uh, um, we're enjoying our 50th year this year, so we have a lot of special events going on, so 50 years is our, um, you know, um, it's our golden anniversary. On September 21st, we are going to be having our annual gala, and it's going to be a special um, um, dinner. So I invite all of you, it's going to be September 21st at the Holiday Inn in Skokie. Um, you'll get more information as um, the, uh, the event gets planned. Um, the MCC has grown over the years. Um, you know, it first started off as an organization um, by a lot of uh, college students. And it, the first, um, it was incorporated at somebody's house in Des Plaines. And now we have over three buildings in Chicago right here, in Morton Grove, and in Skokie. Um, we have a full-time school, we have our weekend school that has been running for about 48 years. Um, our, our mosque is self-sufficient, so we don't get um, donations from other organizations or grants or run by um, our community that just donates um, on a year-to-year -year basis. We are opening up an endowment fund, hopefully to create a self-sufficient. Um, just a little bit about MCC, I'm not going to talk about the details. The Interfaith Outreach Committee does a lot of work, um, and the work that they do is you see the evidence right here, but I'll get back to them in a second. Um, MCC, if you come here on an everyday basis, it is pretty mundane. We got the five daily prayers. On Friday, it gets a little crowded. During our little crowded for our nightly prayers. But in general, it is a pretty boring mosque. But <laughs> In the sense that on an everyday basis. But we do have a lot of great things that are going on in our masjid, in our mosque. 
We, I do honestly believe we are the most diverse mosque in the United States, I'll say states. We have Muslims from Indian Pakistan, the Middle East, uh, we have a huge uh, convert community, um, and you know, we even are starting to see a lot of Malaysians, um, a lot of West Africans, and um, uh, uh, North Africans. Um, over the years, we've had a lot of uh, famous people come to our mosque. Um, in the 1980s, we had two of the greatest. One is our, um, the greatest ever, Muhammad Ali. He came to our mosque. We gave the, the Muslim Community Center gave him an honorary membership. We also had one of the greatest reciters of the Quran, probably in our generation. His name is Kari Abdul Basit. He also came to the MCC over the years. In recent years, a lot of the young people, they like at, at athletes, so we had a lot of celebrities come. Olympian Iftahaj Muhammad came to our annual dinner. Um, she won the bronze medal in fencing. Um, Ennis Cantor, who's an NBA player, has, came, uh, has come. And civil rights activist Mahmoud Abdul Rof has come as well. So the MCC, you know, we've been around for 50 years. So as, as a primarily immigrant community, we've um, experienced a lot of uh, things that happened over the years. In the uh, late 70s, the Iran, uh, the, the Iran uh, oil crisis or whatnot, um, the first Persian Gulf War, um, just a little bit more that hit home to our community. In 2002, we built a mosque um, in our Morton Grove location. And during that time, most of our neighbors were pretty supportive, but there were a lot of neighbors that were not supportive of our mosque. You know, they even went to the point of, you know, putting pig heads in their lawn um, to show that they weren't supportive of building that mosque. But fast forward 17 years later, um, after the New Zealand shooting, we just uh, the interfaith outreach community just did an impromptu vigil, and the, the night, the, literally the day after the shooting of, at New Zealand, and we had over about 7,800 people come to our mosque, mostly from the non-Muslim community to show support. So it just shows you how much we've grown and how much we've come from being a relatively insulated community that wanted to kind of raise our kids in a Muslim environment, but something that's grown a little bit bigger to a community that reaches out to um, all the different neighborhoods in the community. Last thing I want to give um, a little shout out is to law enforcement. Um, they have done a great job of working with the MCC in not only the Chicago Police Department, but also the Morton Grove Police Department, Skokie Police Department, the, wherever we have our mosque, in terms of just cooperating with us. I mean, we cooperate with them, they cooperate with us, and just really, they're there to help us out whenever we are. So if you want to give, there, there's some of them right here, if you want to give them a round of applause for all the work that they've done. Um, it's kind of scary sometimes you see there's a little bit too much security, but really we need that in this day and age. Um, you know, you never know what can happen, but really they've kind of gone um, above and beyond what we've kind of asked them for in terms of helping us out. And that only helps with um, our people that go out and reach out and, and you know build bridges with the community. So on that note, um, I know we can't eat for another 20 minutes, but I will let you guys go. Um, and any questions, we have a lot of MCC board members here. We have a lot of committee chairs here that can answer any of your questions about the MCC. So hopefully I look forward to seeing you in September for our annual dinner.
Mereka Mantas. Assalamualaikum. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Alright, I go. Archbishop Christian Community, Archbishop, please stand up. Dr. Jacob Apago. Thank you for honoring us. Muslim community loves you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great honor for me to presence. I am from Hyderabad, born in Hyderabad in 1947. Uh, I have uh, two more guests. I have Professor Shi Sen and his wife Colleen. They honor us with your presence. Thank you for coming. Joining the Muslim community. I have another friend of mine who comes every year. He's been the fixture of MCC, Anil Pillai. He's at the head of the world. So many Hindu people. Anil, we are honored with your presence. Thank you very much. Shukriya. Shukriya. Thank you very much. So I'm going to do a couple of housekeeping items. And then ultimately, I'm going to give you a little bit of insight as to what's to come uh, for the rest of the evening. For those of you who are new to Islam or less aware of the Muslim faith, there's fundamentally five tenets of belief. Tonight, you're actually going to experience three of the five. So just to kind of run through the list, it really starts with Iman, faith in the belief of the goodness of God. Another important tenet in the religion is called Salah. And later today, we'll hear from a, a Sema Bawamiya, who is a junior? Junior? Junior at Glenbrook High School. She's going to run you through the, the mechanics and the spiritual meaning of prayer. The third pillar of Islam is, is Ramadan. It's fasting from sunrise to sunset. Soon you're going to hear the Adhan, the call to prayer. And during that time, Muslims break their fast with traditionally a date because of the origins of the religion, and obviously water because we are all thirsty in this heat. One of the things that's really important is when you hear the Adhan, it is really a great time to take a moment of silence, to reflect, to be thankful, and to say a prayer. It is a tradition in Islam that the prayers of those who are fasting are especially acknowledged and, and heard. And so we, we invite you to join us in this prayer. The last two pillars of Islam are zakat, which is charity, and this is a special month for zakat. It teaches us empathy, empathy towards others. And one of the most amazing things about MCC is it's not just a mosque, it's actually a community and a social center. Gamran talked about it being one of the most diverse mosques in the country. And I think about a year or two ago, we took a poll and we found, Anjum's going to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there were 34 languages spoken by the congregants of the MCC. 34 languages. If you have time, or if you have a few minutes to spare on a Saturday morning, once a month, the distribution of zakat actually happens in this building. And it's a really special thing to see. When Cameron talked about this, the school in Martin Grove, the school in Skokie being very much sort of a self-sufficient community. It's not really just a community that's inward and self-sufficient. It's a community that's very much outward. It's giving and it's participatory. And one of the most special things to see in this building, literally downstairs one floor, is the monthly passing out of the alms, the charity distribution that happens every single month. And you will see a cross of a broad cross-section of people who come here to partake in that and to benefit from the generosity of this community. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Sama. What it means 
to, to observe prayer five times a day, right, Sana? Um, and prayer really happens starting the first prayer very early in the morning. Um, you are invited to watch us and participate in the Maghrib prayer, which is the fourth prayer of the day, the prayer that occurs when we break our fast. It will happen downstairs. Or you can stay here and eat. Um, and then there will be, at the end of our program, hundreds of people that will come here for what is called the Tarabi prayer. It is a very special prayer that only happens during the month of Ramadan. It is a long prayer, so you need endurance for it. But it's a very fulfilling prayer. So Sama, would you like to introduce?
We have a second sujood again afterward. Once again, reciting the same thing. Glory be to God the Most High three times. This completes one raka or unit of prayer. The cycle from Qiyam to the second sujood is repeated at least once, if not more than once. The shortest prayer is usually two rakats, while the longest is four rakats or, or units. Then we have our final jaloos. Once we come to the end of Salah, we return to our sitting position and we set a set number of prayers called Tashahud. In, in the Tashahud, we repeat our declaration of faith, which is one of our five pillars, by raising our right index finger to act as a witness. We ask God to bestow blessings and peace on our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Abraham. And finally, we ask for mercy to bless everyone on the Day of Judgment. To end our prayer, we have our salam, peace and salutations. We turn face, we face our right shoulder and recite, peace be upon you, and, and the mercy and blessings of God. We repeat this on the left side. This is said to the angels that accompany each human on the left and right. The right recording the good thoughts and actions, the left recording the bad thoughts and actions. Thank you for listening to me. Once prayer time comes and we break our fast, you're all welcome to observe our prayer by following the Muslims going down to the prayer hall. Otherwise, you can just wait here. I myself will be happy to escort anybody. Thank you. our community members into our mosque and at the same time thank them for coming and also just let you know that we appreciate your partnership. Um, everybody in this room is either uh, part of do things um, with your services and, and people come and consult here or they're just friends of MCC. We even have neighbors, you know, from, um, so everyone here I'm sure would be worth um, introducing but let me just name a few of them while well, we have a few minutes. Um, from the North River Commission, is there anyone here? Um, Thomas Applegate, yeah, there is. Raise your hand higher. Yes. And then, of course, Pastor Aaron and Tim Bowman. There are neighbors from the Living Park um, Lutheran Church, and Pastor Aaron's going to do our closing prayer later. Um, Communities United has been a long partner with MCC. Is anyone here? Oh, raise your hand higher. They usually send, not just their director, but they send uh, most of their interns to come to this event, too. Um, is uh, Kishore, I mean, Kishava, Kishore Das here? Oh, there he is. Thank you very much. He's a representative from our Hindu community. Um, and Mr. Fortini, Mike Fortini, did you come? Okay. Oh, there he is. Thank you very much. He's the... Um, our neighbor right across the street, right next to the parking lot, the landscaping and stones. So please, you know, patronize his um, establishment. Um, we had a uh, representative for Senator Ron Villavalam who was coming. Um, ben Tenhaus, is he here? Maybe not. Okay. Well, we do thank uh, Ron Villavalam for responding to us, and he did um, intend to send somebody, somebody. He's in Springfield, apparently. That's why he couldn't come. Um, the police were already mentioned, but I do want to specifically point some out. Um, the uh, commander, Pentacor, wasn't able to come today, so Captain Jerry Hoffman was going to come in his place. Did he? Uh, they were here. Oh, they were here? Oh, okay. There's an emergency somewhere, I guess. Um, but we, we thank them. I hope they understand that, um, how much we appreciate them. Um, from the Indo-American Center, there's several people here. There's an Abu Bakr Mia. Oh, there he is. He's a, a lawyer for the relations. There's several people here from the Chicago Asian community. Anyone here? Shabela? Okay. Okay. 
Um, from Faith and Place, we have Brian Slaughter and his wife, Gabrielle. Um, Faith and Place specifically helps congregations uh, become more environmentally conscious and lower their carbon footprint and all those good things. So we, we did a joint program with them recently, and we're working to you know green this mosque even further. Um, of course, we have uh, Kara Wagner and her husband um, from the St. John's Episcopal Church. Um, and then is there anybody who would like to introduce themselves or say hello? Because we did, the point of this is for people to get to know each other. So why don't we leave you with a few minutes of just introducing yourself to each other at the table. And then um, our call to prayer will be about 8.13. And when we, when we have that, we'll uh, turn on the loudspeaker and the imam downstairs will do the call to prayer. While we're doing that, um, as she pointed out, we can eat our dates and our fruits. So, um, and then from there we'll go to prayer. So, everyone just talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> um, very important, I, I, behind the scenes, the building committee does everything for the facilities, and we also coordinate the security. Um, we have great security and we have you know, uh, things go as smoothly as they do because that build building committee puts so many hours of work. So please join me in thanking them. And last but not the most, and if not first, I want to thank the Almighty. Um, none of us would be here if it weren't for um, the grace that we have in being in a place that's safe, you know, and being in a place that we actually eat to our, our fill. Um, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, but I got a post about this. And they said that if you're, if you're able to eat, if you have a few dollars in your pocket, if you have some kind of shelter, we are doing better than most of the people in the world. And if you're able to walk up those stairs, you're doing you know, better than a lot of people in the world. So um, please be, you know, join me in um, being thankful. And I'd like to call um, Pastor Bowen, Aaron Bowen, to come up and do an actual closing prayer for us. Um, thank you, each and every one of you, for making the effort to come out today. Let us pray. Out of all, thank you for neighbors. Thank you for brothers and sisters who are faithful. Thank you for this gathering tonight, for conversations, for learning. Thank you for holy days through which we grow closer to one another and to you. Thank you for delicious food. As we go out from here and return to our homes, guard and protect us. Guard especially those who have no homes, who are making new homes, who are fleeing violence, who are seeking places of safety, immigrants, migrants, refugees. Guide us to be places of refuge and safety and welcome. And now, let us go and live in peace. Amen. Amen.